Welcome to a very special episode of the Vital Point Podcast. Ordinarily, this is where the episode begins. Uh, However, I felt like today's episode needed just a little bit of context before uh, we got started. So my guest on this episode is uh, Katrina Michelle. She was on episode 39, if you've been following the show for a while. And during our first conversation, we had a really interesting talk on one of Katrina's uh, specialties, which is transpersonal experiences. Those experiences which defy explanation by the normal sort of uh, Western model of consciousness, of psychology, and yeah, um, really interesting subject um, as it pertains to breath work, as it pertains to uh, working with entheogenic and psychedelic um, medicines. And so the first episode that we did, episode 39, um, really was this overview and got into some of Katrina's experiences. And I was really keen to continue the conversation. And when we started to talk about it, uh, Katrina suggested that rather than just sharing in general, she asked if I would be open to sharing some of my uh, own personal experiences. And I thought that was a really great idea, something that was kind of different, unique. As we got into the episode itself, the recording of the episode, I noticed that I was extremely nervous. Then that was like kind of unexpected. Um, there were, there was especially these moments of sort of, uh, verbal dyslexia where words were just not coming out of my mouth in the right, um, the right sequence. And as I breathed into it, as I kind of got curious about what was happening, cause I'm, you know, I, I know how to do this podcast. Uh, I realized that it was just nerves from thinking about sharing some of this stuff that I was about to share. And, you know, Katrina graciously explained that this is very normal, that um, I was going into a very vulnerable place and she did a fantastic job of holding the space. But I, I mentioned it, number one is context for what the episode is about. Um, because I do a lot more talking in this episode than I normally do when I'm working with a guest. And also just to give a little bit of context to the subject matter, you know, these are experiences that I've had in the medicine space, outside of the medicine space. And, um, I share them not to brag, not to, um, boast, uh, but to, have connection to let you know that if you've had experiences that are not explained, um, that you're not the only one and it's a lot more common than you think. You know, when I went through, um, my uh, breathwork training and we were studying the work of Dr. Stan Groff, um, one of the things that we studied was a concept called spiritual emergence which is, you know, the uh, phrase coined by Dr. Groff to explain what happens when people start to have these expanded state of consciousness experiences, start to have experiences that are outside of the realm of normal psychology and can lead to very beautiful openings and shifts and transitions in someone's life. That emergence can also become an emergency. And especially when the the, the experiencer of that um, goes for validation, say to a friend or a therapist, and instead of getting support, um, is met with ridicule, with doubt, with, um, hey, maybe we should medicate you because that sounds like a you know, psychotic type of experience and almost all of the people 
that have suffered spiritual emergency uh, have gotten re-traumatized or more traumatized by going to seek help through normal uh, channels. So I feel like it's very important for us as facilitators, as a psychedelic community at large, to continue to normalize a constructive, supportive environment where we can share our experiences. It's one of the reasons that I am an integration coach. It's one of the reasons that I um, help facilitate integration circles um, through organizations like Silo Health and Empathic Health. Because it's really important to have a community that's supportive, even if it's just listening, even if it's just allowing somebody to speak their truth and reflect on it without the fear of reprisal, of ridicule, of, you know, shame. So that is the reason that I shared these experiences. They are extremely personal to me. And some of these things I have never talked about before. Some of them I've only talked about with very close friends um, or perhaps in a very small confidential integration circle before. Another interesting thing that happened that I want to mention, especially if you are watching this uh, podcast on YouTube, is that there were a lot of weird technical difficulties, especially as I got into the actual experiences themselves. And I was quite um, frustrated as we were recording. And Katrina, you know, she told me that this is not uncommon when one starts to talk about these experiences that are, you know, already outside of the realm of, um, you know, our normal Western understanding. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you uh, need some assistance working with processing, diving deeper into an experience you have, um, I welcome you to get a hold of me, get a hold of um, Katrina Michelle, and um, just know that you are not alone and um, that there is a community out there to support you with these experiences that can be realer than real. So I hope you enjoy this episode of The Vital Point. When it comes to self-development, no matter the method you use, The Vital Point is to practice. If you want to learn methods to transform your life and actively grow into the potential you know is inside of you, then you're in the right place. Welcome to The Vital Point. I'm your host, Jonathan Schechter. I'm a psychedelic integration and transformation coach, breathwork facilitator, and an enthusiast of personal growth. You have the capacity to evolve and bring your intentions and dreams into the world, and there's never been more access to so many incredible modalities that can help you on your journey. This podcast will help you learn about new methods to bring into your life, give you practices to follow, and share stories from practitioners who are doing the work so that you feel inspired to go and practice, because that's the vital point. And I'm super honored today to welcome Katrina Michelle back to the podcast. Katrina holds a PhD in psychology, is a licensed clinical social worker, and is the founder and director of The Curious Spirit, a New York-based psychotherapy and coaching practice offering personal transformation work and retreats. As co-creator and producer of When Lightning Strikes, which is a film, she is seeking to demystify the sometimes unsexy process of spiritual emergence. Katrina is also a member of the Emergent Phenomenology, that's quite a mouthful, Phenomenology Research Consortium, currently conducting research seeking to better understand adverse psychedelic experiences. And this is uh, Katrina's second appearance on the podcast. Um, we had a wonderful first conversation where we talked about spiritual emergence and we talked about her doctoral research in exploring resistance to spiritual emergence. 
And uh, it was just such a great conversation that I really wanted to continue it and maybe even go a little bit deeper as we were kind of talking about off camera before. So Katrina, welcome back to the podcast. Yes, thanks, Jonathan. Excited to pick up where we left off. Yeah, so so last time we really got into like the sort of the groundwork, right, of like what is spiritual emergence, um, where do these transpersonal um, kind of uh, beyond explanation of our current psycholo- psycholo- psych psych ah, gotta talk today psychology um, understanding come from and. So I think maybe just sort of like doing a quick uh, recap of like what that means would be a good place to to get started. So in terms of spiritual emergence, what what does that mean to to you? So spiritual emergence to me is a natural part of the human developmental process one that we don't often talk about in mainstream worlds, uh, but it's one that's inherent to our nature and it involves development beyond the level of ego. And it offers us uh, an opportunity to connect beyond the self to things that may not make sense to the rational mind Uh, It can often include experiences of connecting to the unseen world. And depending on your framework to you, that might mean connecting to past lives, connecting to ancestors. It could be having psychic experiences. It could be having experiences of spirit possession. And these words all point to a certain experience that people talk about and everybody's experiences are unique to them. Um, But the idea when spiritual emergence is embraced and leaned into is that we expand into greater potentials of our capacity as humans. Yeah, it's it's such a interesting time to be talking about this for me, because like I've been putting together this workshop all week that is all about the sort of intersection of breath work and psychedelics and definitely leans on the work of Dr. Stan Groff a lot. And these are all like things that he talks about and sort of the the breath work that I've been trained in, they talk about as these frameworks and these principles, you know? Um, And one of the things that really jumped out at me as I started to go through some of my notes again is that every wisdom tradition has methods of entering into these expanded states of awareness or expanded states of consciousness, you know, whether that's through uh, chanting, praying, dancing, breath work, uh, entheogenic, you know, plants, um, sweating, you know, there's so many different methods, right? But they, there's, always this method of going within and connecting to this higher part of ourselves, this inner intelligence, as, as he would call it. Um, and yet, in our modern Western culture, we're really disconnected from that, right? And so yeah. I think it's really interesting how the things that are now becoming um, sort of en vogue and people are getting interested in as in terms of like their healing potential are really like a return to the, to these ancient methods, you know, like the, uh, I mean, every, you know, if you, if you start to, if you start to dig, you know, like all the different connections to the breath and spirit in terms of the language that's used, you know, in Hebrew and Chinese and in Greek, um, in Sanskrit, you know, it's all pointing towards this experience of going within and being able to expand and being able to connect to something deeper and something outside of the ego, like you said. Yeah, what's old is new again, and we're finding new ways to get there that are 
not necessarily so tied up with what many have found to be the constraints of organized religion over time. I think that, uh, yeah, rediscovering direct access to these states and embracing them regardless of your religious worldview is what really is serving right now. And it's it's really, it's just such an exciting time that we're talking about it and we're not getting as many eye rolls as we used to. Mm, yeah, I agree. And in my, in my experience, there's like the, when these types of experiences have happened or when I enter into these states, um, there's a lack of doubt or questioning. Um, there's something about the experience itself where you're not, well, is this happening? You know, and right. it's, it's interesting, like within all, within the, the framework of breath work, right? Like um, as you start to breathe, there's that thinking mind, there's that like monkey mind, you know, that's asking those questions. Am I doing this right? Uh, why am I doing this? I don't like this song. I could, I should just really stop right now. Or, you know, like <laughs> yeah. all those kind of like chattery thoughts. Um, and then you get to a point where that it's almost like the volume is turned down and somehow like, you tr kind of turn around and you're like, oh, wait, something's different. And you're mm -hmm. not, you're not questioning it anymore. So if something was to happen, you know, something visionary or something that's unexplainable, there's, there, there's that lack of that thinking mind that's like trying to put it into logic or into a container that it understands and is just oh, this is happening. And I guess yeah. to me, like, that's so profound because I live, I've, I've lived my life very aware of that analytical piece of my mind, you know, that's always like, what's happening here? How do we understand this? And what's, how, how, what, you know, is really just asking questions. And so when there's like a lack of that, it's really, oh, wow, that's, it's really uh, noticeable, you know, the, the contrast. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I wonder, amazing, you know, filter. in terms of, yeah, do, do you, do, would you say you relate to that in terms of your own, you know, the first episode, we talked a little bit about you having this experience in New York, like where you right. stepped off the subway and, and you felt this change. And um, yeah, so I'm curious if that relates at all. It does. I mean, I think, you know, and I you hear this repeatedly from people. I've been working with people having these spontaneous experiences, even outside of psychedelic use for a long time. And you hear this repeatedly. The experience was more real than real. So there's the everyday reality that, you know, we can feel, touch, taste, smell, see. And then there's this reality, which when you're transported there, by whatever means you're getting there, breathwork, meditation, yoga, psychedelics, or spontaneous opening, when you're there, you don't doubt it. When you're there, there's a, a noetic sense, like there is something clear and true, and it's beyond the mind, right? We start to recognize that the mind is our filter. It organizes all this information. But when you have that clear, direct experience, it transcends even the mind, even the strongest minds. So I love that you bring up that analytical brain because yeah no matter how analytical the mind is these experiences will trump them every time that's such an interesting thing to think about you know the that the mind is really filtering our experience in these different ways and unless we're training ourselves in some way or practicing opening that filter, we might live our entire lives without actually being aware of the filter that's we're, we're existing in. Yeah, absolutely. We're discounting it. You know, I think this is the challenge with the culture that we're coming from. And, and I do, I say that we're coming from because I do think that we are expanding as a culture who is w willing to embrace a new worldview, a new perspective on these experiences. But um, yeah, we're, we're trained that even if, you know, my understanding is that we are, we have access to this 
these transcendent realms all the time. It's very much there. We are a part of it. We, we are so trained to live within the confines that we've been reared with, where, you know, it begins and ends with the physical worlds that we're missing what's right in front of our face, which is kind of fascinating to imagine that one could live one's whole life and never know what's right there until perhaps they're dying. Yeah. I what, What's coming up for me is like remembering, I think, one of the my first sort of exposures to these types of ideas was watching a film called how to change your mind when it first came out and i didn't know at the time that you know one of the main contributors to that film was dr joe dispenza you know who now i'm like oh like i read and listen and meditate with with dr joe all the time but like the there was this particular do you mean how to change your mind or are you thinking about something else because how to change your mind is the recent oh Oh, i'm sorry yeah Um, no no, uh, you're absolutely right it was uh what the bleep do we know right yes okay got it yeah Uh wow okay i'm all over the place today um yeah so there was this scene in there where he was talking about this exact idea like about how there's so much information that the brain is exposed to all the time that it's filtering out the vast majority of it based on whatever algorithmic patterns it's, you know, encountered before and has decided is safe and interesting and, you know, all those other things. And um, he also made this point, which I can't say is true or not, but like he said, when the, the Spanish conquistadors were coming over and landing on the Americas. The Native Americans literally couldn't see their ships in the yeah. beginning because it was such a foreign idea and foreign concept that like it just didn't register in their in their brain. Right. And when I when I think about the the science of if you look at like the visible, the visible light spectrum and okay, this is exactly what we see. And then you zoom it out and actually realize that this is just a sliver of the energetic wavelengths that we're being exposed to all the time. It definitely makes sense that like, there are things that are happening all around us that we're just not able to process or not open to energetically. Um, Mm -hmm. or just not open to, you know, mentally of like, nope, this is my world and, um, I'm not going to question it. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing that we have access to these different methods of cracking that open. And, um, and I think as I'm getting deeper into this work as a coach, I'm discovering some of the stuff that you are very familiar with, which is like, it's not always this beautiful, like uh, blissful experience. Oftentimes it can be very ungrounding to people and very disintegrating. Um, And then that that's kind of the work is like trying to put that back together, trying to, to figure it out rather than, this beautiful blissful opening that were that's sort of romanticized I think within the psychedelic world you know oh I went and I got 10 years of therapy in one ayahuasca ceremony yeah well maybe there's a reason that something takes 10 years to process without ayahuasca you know that's that's a lot of transformation that's a lot of ungrounding and then you're left with okay what do I do with that Exactly. Yeah, it can, you know, it can in many ways. That's what exactly we're asking of these medicines and these practices is to take us beyond what we know, but we don't know what's there, right? We don't know until we get there. We can imagine or guess based on people we've spoken to or things we've read about, but no one really knows what what they're about to discover when they embark on a journey or practice. And it absolutely can be very shattering for somebody's sense of the world and their self and the world and their reality. 
And just to suddenly be confronted with so much information that the mind can't even conceptualize it is absolutely ungrounding. And for some, they can work with the material and they can move through it more easily. And for others, it really can take them into a place where they're absolutely stuck and frozen. And, and that's why we need people like you to help us work with the material and integrate it back into everyday reality. So we're not just left in that abyss and that state of confusion. Because yeah, having access to these worlds is beautiful and and transcendent. And sometimes it's really scary. And either way, we still need to come back into our bodies and live in this practical world. So what we right. do with that is really important. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> After enlightenment, you still got to chop the water and, and <laughs> exactly. chop, the water, chop the wood and carry the water. I, this, I am in a really interesting space today, like where <laughs> my words or my thoughts aren't quite matching. Um, I think that's because I'm a little bit uh, nervous just to get into kind of the meat of what we wanted to talk about, um, Yeah, which was, you know, usually on this podcast, I'm doing a lot more listening. And you had asked me about if I would be comfortable sharing some more of my own experiences, uh, which is a little bit of a different sort of um, space for me to be in here. And I am, you know, I have thought about uh, sharing some things that really I haven't talked about publicly for sure. And sometimes we haven't really talked about it all outside of maybe a couple of really close friends or, um, you know, I think some, some, some things just not at all. Um, so maybe, maybe that's just making me a little bit more, uh, you know, jittery than I normally am, but that's, that's exciting. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation with you. And I also want to say disclosing experiences like this are, you know, it's such a personal endeavor. Mm -hmm. And in, um, when I was working with assist, the American center for the integration of transpersonal experience or trans transformative experiences, we, we used to train our coaches and our therapists to really respect that moment where somebody is about to share something that's so profound. It's terrifying for them. They don't know how you're going to receive them. They may be questioning reality. They may be questioning their sanity. So that moment of you being receptive and open and non-judgmental is really pivotal. And I think you're illustrating that beautifully by sharing the anxiety that might be underneath the surface here for you, knowing you're about to say things publicly that perhaps haven't been said before. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for naming that. And um, I've, I've found that just m me communicating like what is inside of me is something that helps in these situations, like where I do feel nervous or you know, um, anxious about something that I'm feeling instead of just sort of keeping it inside. And the other thing that, that comes up and has come up for me is like my intention with sharing this, you know, um, which I think is really important for, for myself and for my own practice. Um, my intention with sharing it is not to like, you know, sit around and tell like war stories or, you know, like yeah. it's not egoic in any way. It's my desire is that somebody listening to this would um, relate to it um, and, you know, possibly get some assistance from it and um, that it could also fit into their own integration process. Um, I recently had um, Dr. Saad al Olamat um, on the podcast and we were talking, he, he shared one of his experiences from like a very pivotal uh, mushroom journey where he was talking about this experience of like going into the cocoon and coming out as a butterfly, transforming into the butterfly. And that part of how he's integrated that experience is that, um, butterflies show up for him at these very like amazing like synchronistic times and that they serve as a way for him to like come back to that place of remembrance 
and of presence. And what was interesting about listening to that was I started to see butterflies in the same way, you know, like wow. I, there was a couple of times where like I was going through something and all of a sudden there was a butterfly there and I thought of mm. his experience and then it kind of like helped me to ground into my own, you know, presence and my own like, okay, like, I can just stop and take a breath and like, yeah. you know, just kind of breathe into the magic of the world and, and this present moment. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I hope that by sharing my experiences that, you know, maybe somebody else could have a similar um, kind of impact. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I'm a big believer. And, you know, I used to run these story shares in New York City, kind of, I called it the spiritual, spiritual emergence story shares, um, because I think that's exactly what we need to do. It's, it is really hard to give voice to these experiences, but when we do, we normalize them for other people. And when we normalize them for other people, we begin to promote this as the new culture that we are weaving together, where experiences like this are part of the norm and they become part, you know, more a part of, you know, you talk about not being able to see things that are right in front of you. They become something that we begin to see because now it's a part of our truth. It's a part of our reality. It's no longer fantastic. So I think that's beautiful that you, uh, you're seeing the butterflies too and recognizing them at those pivotal times. Yeah. Jump into it. Um, for me, like my, I would say that my first experience with, with something that I would consider transpersonal came through my Buddhist practice that, you know, I, I've been practicing for almost 20 years and the even encountering Buddhism for me was like somewhat uh, mystical in that like I, I watched my grandmother pass um, from, you know, her physical body. And it, there was a, like a tangible, visible experience that I had. Um, and I felt her presence after that. And, you know, the next day I was, I was in this bookstore and I, I hadn't read like a nonfiction book in that was outside of like for school, you know, like I never, I, I read a lot, but I always read science fiction and fantasy. And I was in this bookstore and I felt that presence and it like stopped me and was like, you need to go down this aisle. Mm -hmm. And I walked down the aisle and it was, and it, it led me right to this particular book on, on Buddhism. And like that one experience like opened into really like, I think everything else that has happened, um, you know, every, I'm literally here sitting in this, this chair right now, um, because of it. And I can trace back these moments, um, from this present moment to that initial opening. Like it really like, was sort of this signpost that changed mm -hmm. the direction of my life. Um, but yeah, like that was, that was the first thing. And then things like that just kept happening within yeah. the context of, of Buddhism. You know, when I met Thich Nhat Hanh, um, and that when I say me, like I just went to see him speak and just bursting into tears you know, just from his words and how they were resonating. Um, and then meeting my main teacher, that that happens every time I see him, you know, and most of the time when I just, if I'm watching him, um, but definitely when I see him like in person. Um, and that's from the first time ever, ever meeting him. Um, wow you know, those type of experiences that are, like you said, realer than real. Yeah. Like, I have no idea why I'm crying. Yeah. Um, there's, it's not like a, there's not an emotion other than joy and presence and just being completely in the moment. 
um, as opposed to sort of like I would guess like normal crying where there's there's some mm -hmm. sort of trigger or there's some sort of right. release or you know emotion and it's almost like I just get so overwhelmed by the energy yes. you know the, the presence of the energy and um there 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 were <laughs> I ended up going to live in Tibet for a year um and I spent a lot of time in his monastery and on the road there um there were several more of these type of experiences like um working with another one of my teachers uh during retreat um yeah, I remember during this retreat, we were doing the practice and um, there was like this column of, uh, of rainbow that just shot out of his chest, like mm -hmm. into me. And this was like several yeah. minutes just sitting in this like column and trying to keep doing the mantra and keep the visualization, but just being completely enveloped by this experience. And the, <laughs> I remember, I remember the, the, the acceptance that I felt from him during that experience. You know, there wasn't, he wasn't like looking at me going like, why is this kid crying? You know, it was just like, yeah, I know, you know, oh. Um, beautiful and then going to Tibet it was like it, it almost made those things like normal because like we would be in these places and you would see footprints in the rocks like the first time I saw that it was like oh that's interesting <laughs> yeah that's something you don't see every day but then like the 10th time you see it you're like okay this is <laughs> I guess it's not, I guess it's not that weird, oh, you know? Wow. Um, That's amazing. But yeah, like I got to go and live at his monastery, which is about 11,000 feet um, elevation, um, about three hours away from the nearest electricity or, you know, tap water, any sort of running water. But when you got into this area, the energy there was so like it's it's hard to describe but like you wouldn't have to try to meditate like if you sat down and you started to mm -hmm. focus on your breath you would just drop into these like really deep states without yeah. a lot of effort and, you know, there were these caves everywhere, like in the area of like where people had been meditating for hundreds, uh, you know, thousands of years. Um, very prominent figures within Tibetan Buddhism, like had done multi-year retreats in some of these caves. And like even, you know, the, the monastery, there was an upper monastery. I was living in the lower monastery. Um, where there was like a village and a school where I was teaching English and most of the monks were up in this upper monastery and I got to go up there and there was a, my, my teacher, one of the things he's known for is like, he always has this prayer wheel and this, you know, this, if you're not familiar with a prayer wheel, like it's, it just, it looks like a wheel that he's spinning that has, you know, millions of mantras and prayers in it. And every time he turns that, it's sending those prayers and that energy yeah. out. And it's like, it's a way to like focus that, that spirit and that energy um, and amplify it. And there's a prayer wheel there in the upper monastery that turns by itself. Like hmm. no one's turning it. It's just going on, wow. the, on the energy. <laughs> so amazing. like, so this is, this is like the, the environment that I've, found myself in even before like experiencing things within the psychedelic space you know 
Um, it's almost like, did you really need psychedelics? <laughs> like, wow, what you're talking about. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah, it, it is incredible. And I feel like I feel really, really grateful to, to have those experiences and to have met those teachers. Um, you know, like very little about that year was like from A to B um, or like what one could just expect to like have happen if they mm -hmm. were to, you know, just go to this country. Like there was, there were, there was this protection and kind of like guidance every step of the way, really. Yeah. Um, and things that, that happened that I just didn't really think about that. I was just like, okay, um, this is what's happening. And I've, I've had lots of opportunity to like, look back on some of those things. And some of them I've, I've had the, the chance to sit there like as sort of a, as an adult quote unquote, and be like, wow, that was really risky. Or like, <laughs> that was really dangerous. And I didn't think about that at all. You know, like there was no, hesitation or doubt it was just like oh this is what we're doing this is what's happening right. and just being being guided by that that feeling mm -hmm. um and that that's actually something that like i've worked on reconnecting with in the last few years like where i started to feel like i wasn't being guided by my my thoughts or my brain that I could open to what was happening in my heart and let that mm -hmm. like be my guide. It's almost like I, the way I describe it, even though I, I didn't have this frame of reference back then, what it feels like now when I connect to that space is it's like, there's like a compass in my chest that's just sort of like giving me the direction. You know, it's just pointing oh, to that it. direction that I need to move in. And if yeah. I open to it, if I surrender to it, like, I don't have to like question, is this the right thing to do? It just is there. Amazing. And I feel like a lot of my work is trying to stay as connected to that space as I can, because, you know, I go through periods where I feel like I'm really connected to it. And then I go through periods where I feel like I'm like way back in my head and yeah. Yeah. kind of dis disconnected from it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really a, a special thing to think about, though, how the heart knows. You know, we say that kind of casually, listen to your heart, trust your heart. But yeah. to actually be in touch with understanding the difference and having that felt sense of truth within versus the analytical mind, which... Thank you. We need an analytical mind. It's a wonderful gift to have. And also we need to be able to hear the heart because that's when I think we can really lean into the fullness of our own paths is when we can really listen to what we're here for, you know, being guided by and uh, not just making those analytical decisions that can only take us so far. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for, thank you for bringing that up that both are, necessary and they're not really separate um from a certain perspective mm -hmm. right like um and i think that the way that i understand that is through that lens of buddhism of non the way that buddhism dis, uh describes the non-duality you know that emptiness is form and form is emptiness you can't really have one without the other and they're not they are separate but they're not separate at the same time mm -hmm. so yeah. i I'm very fortunate for Buddha to, to my Buddhist practice for like giving me a lot of the framework to understand this type of stuff, you know, and certainly yes. it's not the only framework, but it's like what has made sense to me. And then when there are things that have come up in the medicine space that are like, whoa, what's going on here? It's, um, it's a blessing to be able to like go back to that framework and say like, oh, this makes sense. And I know that I'm not the only one with that, right? Like, you know, Ram Dass and mm -hmm. Timothy Leary 
published uh, interpretation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead for people using psychedelics in the 60s, you know, like because Timothy Leary read the Tibetan Book of the Dead and was like, this sounds like an acid trip, you know, like, so Mm -hmm. um, it's incredible, like how those experiences like we're able to uh, use the ancient wisdom traditions to help us understand you know and realize that like hey we're not alone in this like you know you're connecting mm-hmm. to something that's much bigger than the small I um, or just this life experience that, that you have Yes. Yeah, that gives you the capacity to navigate the psychedelic induced states. So yeah, I guess the the next thing that I wanted to to share about was like starting to work more intentionally with with plant medicine. And mm-hmm. I was saying that um the the Buddhist practice gave me a framework for things that came up during the medicine experience that were sort of like, oh, this is something within my psyche or within my mind because I've practiced this or I have a a reference for it. And then the stuff that was a little bit more, huh, what's happening here was where I didn't have a a frame of reference for it. Um, The first time I sat with ayahuasca, I encountered this, um, this being that was like this, um, this warrior, uh, wearing this kind of loincloth, um, like an animal skin. And he had like this, like spear, um, And at first, like, I couldn't even really make out his features. It was just, like, I knew that this being was there. And I started to just kind of expect that in the medicine space, he was going to show up. And it was actually something that, like, I would work with my, um, my somatic experiencing therapist with. And, like, over time, it just... He kept showing up. It started to almost be like the beginning of a resource for me. You know, like I would, as I would be doing integration work with my therapist and, you know, she would ask me like to call in, is there, is there somebody that you can call in to support you and to protect you or to like, to lend you support? I would go to this, this figure And I guess in the beginning, I thought this is like, this is my, this is my higher self or an aspect of my higher self, Mm -hmm. which I still think is true, but I think that that relationship has gotten a lot more complex. Um, So there was, there was one night and I actually wasn't in the medicine space at all. Um, to be fully transparent, I had taken some MDMA much earlier, but I was like, I was done with it. I was not in, mm-hmm. in all, I didn't feel like I was in an altered state, but I was, right. um, I was, uh, I was laying on my bed and this song came on, um, a song by uh, an artist named Manish Damore and uh sort of like a medicine artist and it was uh like in the song there was um um, the mantra of of shiva the you know like sort of the mantra that everybody knows the om namah shivaya Mm -hmm. but there was also this other the song is called triambakam and there was this other like mantra and that, that he was singing. And for some reason, um, I got really curious about 
well, what is what does that triumbicum mean? You know, what what else is going on in this song besides this Om Namah Shivaya that he's saying? And I picked up my phone and I I Googled it, and the first thing that came up was that warrior from my from my experiences. And I my my experience of Shiva at that point was like the dancing, the dancing Shiva, mm -hmm. the the Nataraja. Yeah. I had no idea that there were these other avatars, these other manifestations of Shiva, and that this particular Mahadeva manifestation that the Triambakam was his mantra. And as soon wow. as I saw that, I mean, I just immediately, again, just began to like weep and be, feel this yeah. connection to something that was a lot bigger. You know, my heart just kind of cracked open and I was there with the song and the energy and like, there was a lot of stuff that started to make sense mm -hmm. in that moment, you know, of like, oh, that's what I've been seeing. And this is this connection. Um, and it act that that sort of experience like actually continued through the weekend, like in this variety of ways. Like I went to the self-realization fellowship uh, lake shrine in los angeles with my dad and there was an experience that kind of was mm -hmm. like hey we're not done with this yet uh, uh -huh. there um but that like again there was no prior reference or like understanding whereas yeah. like if something buddhist would pop up in the medicine space it was like oh that I could I could use yeah. my analytical mind to like explain that. Uh -huh. And this was totally different. Um so I think that that really started to like deepen that connection and that relationship to something like outside of myself. Mm -hmm. And then the kicker, <laughs> uh, this is, I mean, several, I would say probably at least six months later. Um, my partner and I were in the middle of a mushroom ceremony. And um, I... I remember having a thought that I needed to make an offering to Shiva. And I remember getting up and taking um, a, like a tea light candle and lighting it like as an offering. And at that point, um, Shiva came into my body, and I was like a. You ever seen being John Malkovich, where like mm -hmm. when they're inside John Malkovich and they're watching themselves be inside somebody else's body? Oh yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it was like. Like I. I knew that I wasn't in control, that there was this other right. energy within me. Yeah. Um, and the amazing thing was my partner immediately noticed it too. Uh -huh. And I was like sharing this consciousness with Shiva. I knew what was happening. He was there to do this healing on her. And wow. he, I'm not even going to say I, yeah. he started to dance 
And that was like a really important part of this was like uh-huh. that when, when we, when we've talked about it after that, she's told me, she's like, that's how I, that's one of the ways immediately I knew that there was something different because you dance a particular way and you were oh. moving <laughs> in a completely, with a completely different presence, with a completely different wow. energy. Um. And I was just watching myself, my body do this dance and through this dance, doing this like energetic healing. And I was mm-hmm. watching what it was doing to her. Like I, I could see the lines of energy and like he was working on her chakras and like it was incredible. Um, and again, like realer than real. Yep. And mm-hmm. she, she was sitting there just like crying, watching and, um, at the, I remember at the end he said like, um, uh, I mean, I have like, I mean, we've, we've done a lot of integration around this particular mm-hmm this particular thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was like a couple of things that he said, like, cause in the beginning she was kind of like looking at me, trying to figure out, like I could see her mind trying to like figure out what was happening. And mm-hmm. I remember saying like, look with this eye, don't look with these eyes. Uh, yeah. And she kind of got it and she relaxed into whatever was happening. And then at the end, he said, you know, I'm here to teach you, to love you and to serve you, you know, and he kind of like bowed and then it was done. And as soon as as it was done, like I was like, completely energetically drained like I literally just kind of fell over onto the like the mat and was just like 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 spent yeah Um, and I mean this was this was like over the course of maybe five to ten minutes this was going on yeah and again like I have absolutely no doubt about Mm. that happening um i know that something happened i know that there was some other presence Uh there's there's some other presence there that was not me it was a very very distinct feeling and experience of like watching this higher intelligence inhabit my body and like Mm -hmm. having a little that shared just from being the vehicle right of course you know that i could see what was going on i could see like this higher dimensionality of what of what was happening but Uh still like being that human sort of in the corner watching being like what is Mm -hmm. what is happening here um amazing and in terms of like, in terms of integration for that, that's still something that like I am working on integrating for sure. Yeah. And, I mean, of course, kind of a big deal to you know, have Shiva and him yeah, have a body. Yeah. Well, you know, like when I, I remember during our first conversation, when we were talking about the transpersonal experiences, and I, I think I said something that I was alluding to where it's like, you have these experiences and then you're like, what does this mean? Like, am I supposed to just go live in an ashram now and like drop everything else in my life? Because I've seen it, you know, Mm -hmm. I've experienced it. It's not like something I'm reading about in a book. And it also feels like, well, this is so significant it has to mean something like there has to be some sort of reason for it. And like, I don't Mm -hmm. want to let it just slip away or go back to like life as, as I know it. 
Mm-hmm. You know? And it doesn't seem like you're doing that. You know, it seems like you are actually being a vehicle for people to understand these spaces, understand their own experiences with this work. And again, it's it's super brave of you to share this so openly. Thank you. I remember talking with my therapist about it and she said, so do you think that like do you was that you and i'm like i i really don't know how to answer that question you Mm -hmm. know but what i can say is that being able to call upon that part as a resource has strengthened it's something that i've continued to like to work on yeah and it's still like, I mean, it's not something where I have an expectation of like being done with it or being able to understand mm-hmm. it. In fact, um, earlier this year, I um, I got had the opportunity to, to go and help lead a retreat um, where I was able to offer meditation and breath work and I uh, lead all the participants through an ice bath and it was a big level up in terms of like stepping into this new role and and, you know outside of like Jonathan as a corporate employed you know business system analyst Uh and there was a lot of resistance that came up around it Mm -hmm. um, while I was there you know, there was a lot of like doubt and like um, fear and at the same time, like excitement for like, yes, I feel like th- I'm really stepping into something. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a there was a journaling activity during the retreat where that was one of the journaling prompts was like, um, write about an encounter with a deity that you've had. Oh. And wow. I ended up writing about this. And it really unlocked a lot. Like I was sitting yeah. there as a, like after I had, I, I ended up sharing it with the group and I had no idea that sharing it would have been as emotional as it was. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, it like unlocked a lot within me of like, oh, it was almost like, hey, remember that thing? Like, you're not done with it yet and you need yeah. to pay attention to it. Yeah. Um, and that kind of continued through the next couple of days where like I reconnected to that energy. Um, it helped me let go of a lot of fear and shame because mm-hmm. that, was, that was what was coming up was like, how could I still be working a corporate job? Like, how could I not have completely changed my life? Like, I've read about people that have experiences like this and they like, it's completely transformative. And here, like, I've had more than one of these experiences and I'm still, Mm -hmm. like, I still haven't gotten the message yet. Like, what's, what's the matter with me? And when I opened up to that, the response that I got was like, I'm always here. You just have mm-hmm. to remember. Like, yeah. and there was no judgment. It was all love. You know, it wasn't yeah. like, you, you have to remember. Yeah, right. It was just like, I, I love mm-hmm. you. And, you know, I'm always here. That's so beautiful. Right. Yeah, it comes from that, uh, yeah, that, that human, that human place, right? That like, that, that analytical and sort of normal state. Hmm.
Yeah, and I, I guess what's coming up for me right now in the moment is like just like I've been able to look back over the course of like 20 years to like things that happened in that in those like early years of Buddhist practice and see like, oh, mm -hmm. that actually led me exactly where I am right now. Because mm -hmm. like a lot of the things that I skipped over, for instance, are like I met my ex-wife in Tibet. The reason I came yeah. to Arizona was, you know, to fall following that relationship and the dissolution of that marriage is what led me into coaching and led me into, you know, mm -hmm. more exploration, more inner exploration and healing with plant medicines and with breath work and like led me into what I'm doing now. So yeah. there's a certain amount of clarity where I can look back and say, oh, and connect those dots. And instead of being hard on myself or judgmental, I'm guessing that at some point I'm going to be able to look back on what I'm going through now and what I feel like I'm struggling with now and see, oh, all of that was necessary and a part of the journey. And like, you know, instead of being judgmental about it, like see how it all fit into the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. there's like the, there's there's some sort of clarity i think sometimes that that like integration gives us that it's challenging to have when we're in the middle of it yeah how could how could we right right yeah how does it feel talking about all of this It feels like another step, like like mm -hmm. in terms of like opening and really just trusting uh, rather than like being judgmental about it. I think like kind of what, what I've been talking about. Yeah. Um, I certainly like I feel very, um, I feel very quiet and still uh, in my body, like there's like a, mm -hmm. a stillness, a lack of, um, agitation, I would say. Mm -hmm. And not to say that, like, I, I wasn't really conscious of it before. And when we started the, the recording, but it was definitely mm -hmm. coming out in my words, you yeah. know, in terms of like, like sort of almost getting like this weird dyslexic kind of thing where like there were words mm -hmm. coming in the wrong order and right um you know and then was like oh what what is that and i could kind of breathe into it and go oh i'm i'm nervous about sharing this stuff um and right now i feel very very still and i feel very grateful to you for for listening and holding space and finding it interesting you know oh yeah you're this is the most interesting thing for me i i love listening and i'm just so grateful to witness your sharing because it's like you're back in that experience when you're reflecting on it and so to be in the presence of that energy for me is really special yeah yeah, thank you. It does it does feel like I'm back in it in some way. Mm -hmm. I think that's where that stillness is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not sure how the silence is translating for the podcast, but it's just it <laughs> feels natural in terms of us having this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all need more yeah. stillness and permission to access it. So. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I feel like the last. So, so this sort of, I would say, like this chapter began at the sort of tail end of 2018, and 
for like three years after that, there was a lot of expansion and a lot of ceremonies and medicine experiences and a lot of working on myself. And <laughs> um, in the last year, really, I guess the last like 18 months, um, I've been, I, I, I can't say that I've been completely psychedelic sober, but it's been much, um, much more microdosing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, even when I have journeyed, the dosage has been a lot lower. And I know that this isn't unique to me. Like I know, like Beth's talked about it too. And I wonder if, if you can relate to this, like, it's almost like I've become more sensitive to medicine. Like as I've continued to work with it, mm -hmm. like I can go deeper with less. Yeah. Um, but I haven't sense. even really, I haven't even really had what I would call like these really like deep experiences. They've been very microdosing and kind of like it's, it's, it's been much more focusing on integration. And so it's mm -hmm. like, it's almost like I had like a heck of a lot of stuff that I worked through and had, you know, experienced in a short period of time. And because of that, it was like, oh, okay, now I just need to like take a step back and, uh -huh. you know, and breathe into it and like be curious about like, what does this mean? And continue to try to unpack it because when there's stuff that's happening, like, week after week or like you know you're sitting like once a month or something like that it's almost like yeah like even that shiva experience right it's not like i had the space to just like okay this is what i'm working on in my integration this is what i'm working on in therapy like yeah it was a big milestone or a big like marker on the road but then I jumped into another experience or I had something yeah. else come up that I had to like, that was like very acute in the moment of like, this is what I'm working on now. So um, I guess I wouldn't recommend that to other people, you know, in terms of like, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's okay to like titrate it a little bit. It's okay to give yourself exactly. some space between those experiences um, and certainly like we've been talking about so that it doesn't become disintegrating, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that you can get some therapeutic benefit from those experiences rather than losing it in the moment, you know, exactly. or being yeah. overwhelmed by everything else that's happening. Yeah. But it is, yeah, it's, it's, it does feel really nice to to go back to that, to that space for a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe there's more for you there to work with too. I definitely think that there's more for me to work with. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm really, I'm really appreciative of what I've been able to experience and like understand out of those experiences you know themselves yeah. like and some of it is just you know some of it's funny the my teacher the one that i had that experience with the rainbow with mm -hmm. um he was the one that that suggested that i go to tibet i um uh, I wanted to do a three year retreat, which is like a traditional thing within the lineage that I practice in. Mm -hmm. And I was like gung ho on doing that. And so I was doing the preparation work for it. That was my goal. Like I had stopped mm -hmm. working. I was living in upstate New York with my grandfather on his farm so that I could just have the space to do this preliminary practice and get myself to this place where I could go be isolated for three years and just practice meditation. Yeah. And he said, uh, that's, you know, that's cool, but why don't you go become a translator? And I was like, 
I don't know how to do that. I don't have any money to go to school for that. And he's like, you don't need that. Just go teach English in Tibet. We'll, we'll take care of it. So like, that was this moment where I was like, okay, cool. Trust. Right. Yeah. And then before we, before I left, like this is months later, I was, we were going to lunch and he said, you like girls? And I said, Rinpoche, like, you know, I want to do a three year retreat. Like I'm not trying to get involved in a relationship. And he go, he looks at me and he goes, I think when you go to Tibet, you're going to meet a nice girl. Oh, and wow. I'm like, dude, like, I want to go do this retreat. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, I, I kind of laughed at him, you know, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, yeah, sure. And then I met my ex-wife yeah. when I was over there. She actually was one of the people that came with us. Like I met her on the way and we bonded Whoa. through that experience. Right. Fascinating. And apparently he had said something similar to her. Like, mm -hmm. He she uh, he had a picture of he and I and he was like, Dave, <laughs> what do you think of this boy? He's a nice boy, isn't he? Oh and she goodness, was like, I love it. Okay, yeah, sure, whatever, you know. And um, I remember, like a couple. I guess I guess, I want to say like a couple of months after the first round of, of ayahuasca ceremonies um i had this experience uh with the medicine buddha i like i opened this book randomly and it was talking about the medicine buddha and i had this vision of these medicine buddhas and if you're not familiar with the medicine buddha he's blue he's a blue buddha and he has this bowl of medicine and this this medicinal plant and at the time there was like a lot of synchronicity between that and ayahuasca mm -hmm. but the name of my brand is blue magic alchemy mm -hmm. both shiva and the medicine buddha are blue so it's like oh, the reason that yeah. like the that whole idea came out of these experiences and as i was having this experience of the you know these visions of the medicine buddha that teacher came to me and he was there and he was like laughing and he's and he said do you get it now like Ooh. do you understand and he and he i mean he was a jokester you know so like he like uh -huh. wasn't it was very like jokey. Like he was like, Oh, you get it? You know, like and kind of laughing oh, about so it. Cool. And it was like, Oh my God, like, yeah, I get it. Okay. <laughs> like, you so know, cool. do you, you get why all this had to happen? Mm -hmm. Cause at that point, like I was still like I was really hurting, you know, and like I was married for eleven years, you know, in this relationship for like thirteen years and I had been out of it for less than a year. You know, I was still mm -hmm. really starting to peel off some of the top layers and asking a lot of questions in terms of like, why did this happen? And, yeah. You know, um, and there he was like, you get it? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, you you're you're right there's definitely a lot more there for me to unpack and and to work with and i am grateful for the ways in which it continues to unfold and present you know it's a beautiful thing Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I love that we've connected uh, around this, you know, because like, I, I just remember going through my breathwork training and like, getting this very cursory introduction to Stan Groff and like the work that he was doing. And 
feeling amazed that like other people have had these type of experiences yeah. and that there's like oh. doctors and like people that have written books about it and like catalog yeah. stuff and I remember I remember one of my my mentors like saying if you you there's this one book by Stan Groff that you should read and it like catalogs all the different types of expanded consciousness experiences. And if you've had an experience that isn't in this book, <laughs> go contact Dr. Groff because he would love to talk to you. And that's how extensive this, you know, wow. this compendium of experiences mm -hmm. is. And I was like, whoa, like this is, this is yeah. amazing. This is some interesting stuff. I want to know more right. about this. And then, yeah. you know, meeting you and getting to know you and like, oh, this is what you studied for your doctorate? I know, Amazing. Right? Like, tell, tell me, me more. About like, it. I just want to know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's so thrilling for me. And it's, you know, I think it's where we're going. I think people are ready for more. I think they're hungry to get back to these, you know, the truth in these transcendent experiences. And Again, I think more people are having them than let on. So let's give people yeah. permission and keep sharing and keep opening up for other people to explore with us. Absolutely. And you know, find find the communities where you can share because you are gonna be yeah. accepted and heard yeah. in the right place. And like, yeah, it's it's scary to think about opening up some of this stuff, especially if it's like, I mean, I remember going back into work after like ayahuasca ceremonies and like walking into meetings mm -hmm. and it would be like, so what did you do this weekend? And I'm like, yeah. uh, I don't even know <laughs> how to begin to exactly. answer that question. And yeah. I would not feel comfortable talking about it. Yeah, so, exactly. you know, to, to have the kind of, um, community and environment where you can share this kind of stuff is so crucial and i love yeah. i love what you shared earlier about the um you know the story time and uh yeah you know, i know you're involved in you know integration and mm -hmm. i'm i'm really appreciative for people like you that are out there like spreading this message and and being accepting of it, like holding the space and yeah. you know, witnessing and listening as well as, you know, sharing and, and having your own experiences because it's, it means a lot. Mm. Just leave it at that. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. I agree. And uh, yeah, we're on similar paths holding space for others in this way and it feels really nice to to know you a little bit more uh deeply after your shares today so thank you thanks for going there with me yeah thanks for suggesting it it's definitely yeah definitely cool um okay well if you haven't listened to the first episode with katrina i would definitely recommend that um it will give some more context around this and um, there's really great information. I remember we got into some of the harm reduction aspects and just, you know, more context is good. Um, I've been really experiencing that lately of like, we're sort of in this weird attention deficit space now where everything's like TikTok and reels and really short form. And that can be good, but context is also really good and really important. And so, um, definitely recommend checking out that first episode uh, if you haven't already and um, yeah uh, checking out the curious spirits and um, with your film it's called when lightning strikes yeah. right when lightning strikes yes yeah yeah and, I mean it basically goes into a lot of these topics right it does. Yeah. We're focusing primarily on um, the challenging experiences of awakening, but uh, yeah, all the, all the experiences of whatever you've had happen to you are welcome and important and worthy of being shared when you're ready and disclosing to people who can really hold it. Yeah. So outside of Instagram, 
um, where else can people go to to find your work? Yeah, my website is uh, thecuriousspirit.org. And yeah, I have a list of the various services and offerings. We have some therapists working with us. And um, right now I'm excited to be launching a coaching program specifically for helpers and healers, helping them support their own process and calling it Return to Self. It's a nine month container. We'll do some... Um, transpersonal states work and uh, whatever modality calls to you and we'll have some retreats and it'll be it'll be a really great way to take care of yourself and meet others in like-hearted community so get in touch the curious org if that feels good for you yeah definitely recommend katrina um was able to give her a referral because, uh, you know, I'm on the West Coast, she's on the East Coast, and, um, you know, heard rave reviews and high praise um, from from that person on their experience with, with Katrina. So, and I just, from getting to know her, I, I would definitely recommend um, getting in touch with her and, and working with her. She's awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much for listening to this very vulnerable uh, episode. Uh, it's exciting to have gone there and I really appreciate you Katrina for for holding that space and encouraging it and um, yeah um, thank you I guess that's all I want to say is just um, thanks for being here and, and holding the space in your own way and like I said earlier like I hope this inspires you to be a little bit more vulnerable about you know something that you've been holding on to um, and just know that there is community out there and, um, you know, family that will support you and listen and hold the space uh, without being judgmental. So until next time, my friends, uh, I'm going to sign off and just uh, kind of bask in that afterglow, I think. <laughs> so see you next time on The Vital Point.